Hello, hello. So this is the beginning of a little reading vlog that I'm doing as part of our Lamers read along. And in this particular reading vlog, I am tracking my experience rereading the first four books of part one, Fontaine. I will be leaving little timestamps down below in the description box to tell you when I'm discussing certain sections. So if you are part of the read along and you're reading Lamers, you know how to navigate this video. As well as talking about specific sections, I'm also going to be having like little discussions on various things to do with Lamers just generally. So in that vein, for future reading vlogs I'd love to get any questions that you have about Les Mis that I can chat about in these reading vlogs. I'm not an expert in Les Mis by any means but you know I have read it before and I do have like 10 years of experience with the musical and of thinking about Les Mis and looking things up so I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> if there's anything that I can discuss then I'd like to. In this particular video I talk about the pronunciations of different characters and place names. In the future I am thinking about doing videos on things like why is the book called Les Miserables, talking about the digressions that Victor Hugo goes on and what the purpose of them is. I already know that I'm going to be doing like whole separate videos about the differences between the book and the musical and I'm going to be splitting them into different parts. One video for each part of Les Mis, so there should be five videos in total about the differences between the book and the musical just because there is a lot to talk about. However, I will admit that these vlogs may not be quite the place for like very long-winded questions or very complex questions like what is the French Revolution and why is it relevant to Les Mis? Partially because I don't think I'm particularly qualified to talk about the French Revolution in any sort of detail and also we could do like a 10-part video series about the French Revolution and we still wouldn't cover everything. But with that in mind, I have started cobbling together a little playlist of like resources that you can go to, particularly for like the historical context. I've put that down below in the description box as well as on the Discord server. Different things have been popping up every now and then, you know, things like pronunciation, things like what has the French Revolution got to do with this book, and I'll be adding to it more and more as time goes on. So if you did have any lamest questions for me to talk about in these videos, even if it is like about the musical or about my opinions to do with certain characters, I'd love to answer them. I could even talk about like my favourite songs in the musical or like my dream cast or my thoughts on different adaptations. I don't know, just anything to kind of make it a little bit different and not just be a reading vlog. Anyway, that's my little introduction done and we are going into the reading now. Hello, hello, it is the 1st of January, which means that it is the first day of our read-along of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Woo! So we'll be starting on this today. I hope that you're all excited or a little bit terrified. You know, both emotions are good. Both emotions are valid. I'm pretty hyped to be getting into this, so we're very excited to see what everybody all thinks. <laughs> bit bright. Um... No? Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, so I've just been reading a little bit of Lemis. I've gotten up to page 24 so far, so still in the first chapter of book one. And yeah, I may only be 24 pages into this, but I love this book so much. So in this first chapter of Lemis, you're being introduced to the character of the Bishop of Dean. You're basically getting a bit of background story on him and the different things that he did, how he became a bishop in the first place. And it's basically because he actually met Napoleon and he really impressed him in conversation. And then it goes into all of the different acts, the different things that he does as bishop to improve the lot of the people, especially the poor. If more people were like this bishop, then the world would be so much better. So as bishop, he's given a salary of about 15,000 francs a year. He keeps about 1,000 for his own personal expenses and the rest of it goes back into the towns that he goes to. 6,000 of those francs are given directly to the poor. And everyone's really surprised by this. They're just like, well, he has this massive salary, so of course he's going to spend it all on himself. But he prefers to live much more simply. There's even a moment where he gets reminded, oh yeah, you can also ask the government to give you an extra 3,000 francs so that you can like hire out a carriage to go on your routes to see all of the different people. And he's like, oh yeah, I am entitled to an extra 3,000 francs. <laughs> I can't say that word. I've literally tried to say that sentence three times. And everyone's like, oh yeah, see, see, he said that he was going to live a simple life, but actually he's super materialistic. See, he's taken that extra 3,000 francs. And then when you actually look at the budget, he's not keeping any of that money for himself. He's not even using it on the carriage to go on the rounds. He's using it to give to the poor again. It seems really, really simple and really obvious when you think about it, because it's like, yeah, of course, if you were a priest, that's what you should be doing. If you're the bishop, you should be giving that money back to the people. But the truth is, is that especially in this time period, people are not doing that. And the thing that is really coming across with the bishop is not only is he a very good, very kind man, but obviously he's very, very smart. He kind of knows how to game the system to get what he wants. But instead of exploiting the system for the benefit of himself, he's exploiting it for the benefit of the people around him to make people's lives better. I was reading this and I had my pencil out ready to make annotations and I usually don't annotate that much, but I just ended up underlining 
and highlighting so much. There's so much in this first chapter that applies to the rest of the book and so much in this first chapter that I think you can apply to your everyday life as well. Major themes that are coming through already are things like what do we do in times of uncertainty? How do we respond? Something that is very relevant for right now. The one sentence that he speaks to Napoleon is all about this concept of what it is to be good as opposed to what it is to be great. Napoleon is a great man but he as a priest is a good man and what do we value more? There's a sentence which talks about the beauty of goodness as opposed to you know more physical beauty and it reminded me a lot of that Roald Dahl quote that is like if you have good pure thoughts then you will always look beautiful even if you are conventionally not very attractive if you have these beautiful thoughts and do good deeds then your beauty your inner beauty will radiate out of you that's what it kind of reminded me of. Straight away the themes of inequality when he takes up his position as the Bishop of Dean uh, he's given this massive like mansion of a house which he is very uncomfortable with and he ends up going to the local hospital and seeing what cramped living conditions they live in and there's this great conversation where he basically is like hey this isn't right let's swap places so he takes up this tiny little hospital as his home and then gives his mansion as the new hospital so he takes the director of the hospital to his house and he says obviously something's wrong here you have 26 in five or six small rooms there are three of us here and we have room for 60. something's wrong i tell you you're in my house and i'm in yours you give me back my house this is where you belong. Without thinking, he gives up his house and retreats to the much, much smaller place. You're just left to think about the inequality of the distribution of wealth and material and opportunities. Something that really comes through is his belief in how circumstance is what causes crime, not somebody's inherent goodness. Furthermore, he was the same with everybody, whatever their social status. He would not condemn anything without due consideration or without taking circumstances into account. He would say, let's see how the wrongdoing was arrived at which is going to come really into effect later when he meets Jean Valjean and he sees him as a man who has got so much goodness in him but his circumstances of his life have pushed him to crime whilst everybody around him in his society is very quick to condemn people and to jump on a bandwagon of blame he does not do that when he saw everyone condemning very loudly and being very quick to express indignation oh my he would say with a smile this looks like being a great crime that everyone commits here we have hypocrisies in fright, hurrying to protest and take cover. And I mean, that's something that we now, on the internet especially, are grappling with. The ways in which arguments break out very quickly and people want to take sides and people are quick to blame other people. People want to jump on bandwagons and be like, look, I am completely blameless. I am completely faultless, when that is not the truth. I'm now going downstairs to get a cup of tea, but those are some of my thoughts at the beginning of this book. And everything that's come up today on this read-along of Loomis is, um, uh, how do you pronounce anything? Obviously this book was originally written in French, it's set in the 19th century, and there are a lot of French names that people, especially people who haven't uh, seen the musical before, don't know how to pronounce. So I have dumped a few pronunciation guides in the notes and resources section of our Discord server. Hopefully that's going to help people out. But at the same time, it's a bit of a test for me because I have not spoken French since I was 13. Even though I know the show really well and I know the book, I've read the book before, um, I can't necessarily say that my pronunciation of everything is correct. And I know that there are some French speaking people who are taking part in this read along. So please, uh, if there are any pronunciation corrections that you can give me, go right ahead because a lot of my pronunciation is based on the musical. But you know, just to test myself, I'm going to go down the different character and place names on a list which I'll link down below. And uh, please tell me if I've got any of these wrong. <laughs> First off, we have the main character, Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean. The main antagonist is Javert. Javert. The character whose face is most iconic to Les Mis is Cosette. 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 And her mother is Fontaine. Fontaine. Then we have Marius Pontmercy. Marius Pontmercy. The leader of the student rebellion is Enjolras. 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 Then we have the main villains of the story who are the Thenardiers, Monsieur and Madame Thenardier. Their daughter, Eponine. 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 Their other daughter, Isalma. Isalma. And their youngest son, Gavroche. 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 How do you do? My name's Gavroche. <laughs> the other friends of the ABC who are Fouy, Grantaire, Grantaire. This is the one that I never know how to pronounce because they don't pronounce it in the show. Legle, Legle, Legle. Ah, Kofarak, Kofarak, Comfer, Comfer, Jolie, Jolie. Oh God, I don't know how to do this one. Bamatabwa, 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 Bamatabwa. I always just kind of read it as it's spelt, but I know that that's not right. Bamatabwa, Bamatabwa, Bamatabwa. Fauchelevent, 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 Fauchelevent. Fauchelevon. Then we have members of Thenardier's gang. Brujon. Brujon. Babé. Babé. I can't even remember this character. Kiaxo. Kiaxo. 
I, I can't even remember who this character is. And I think this is the final one of Tenardio's gang, Montpenas. Montpenas. Then we have a real life character, General Lamarck. General Lamarck. And then the cover name that Jean Valjean takes when he is the mayor of Montreuil. Montreuil, is that right? Is Monsieur Madeleine. And then the place names, oh God. <laughs> uh, Toulon. Toulon. So this says that it's pronounced Montreuil sur mer. I thought it was pronounced Montreuil. And I'm pretty sure that the BBC miniseries says Montreuil. Tell me if that's wrong. Saint Michel. Saint Michel. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Rue de Bac. Rue de Bac. Saint Antoine. Saint Antoine. Saint Martin. Saint Martin. Rue Plumet. Rue Plumet. And finally, I think this is the street where the barricade is put up. Rue de Villette. Rue de Villette. Basically, this is an exercise in me finding out if I'm pronouncing things right. <laughs> Okay, so I'm on my second day of reading Les Mis. I'm still only on page 26, so we're pouring slowly over it. We're writing a lot of things down, annotating a lot, but I got to a bit last night that got me so excited. So we've got to a section where they're talking about really the only possessions, the only luxuries that the bishop has, and it says, it must be acknowledged though that of his former possessions, he was still left with six silver forks and spoons and a large soup ladle that for Madame Maglore were a daily joy to see gleaming splendidly on the white linen tablecloth. Later on, he says, the bishop even admits it would be hard to give up eating off silver, and off this silver are two large candlesticks. And I'm like, <laughs> if you know, you know. Hello. So it is Sunday the 3rd of January today. I've just finished doing a two hour reading sprint along with Shannon at 155 books, Aoife at Pretty Purple Polka Dots and Anna at Read To Me At Midnight. If I've not included like a clip from that, then I will put it down below. But that was just such a fun experience to be able to blast through a few pages of Les Mis. I managed to get to the end of book two of Fontaine. So what happens at this second book of Les Mis is we are introduced to the character, the main character, Jean Valjean. He has just been released from prison. He has spent 19 years in prison for stealing a loaf of bread. It was five years for that initial crime, but because he ended up trying to escape four times, you know, years were added onto that sentence. He goes to the town of Dina, he like knocks on everybody's doors, he's trying to get work, he's trying to have food and shelter just for one night. And initially people take him in, but as soon as they find out that he is an ex-convict, he gets shunned away, he gets turned away. Eventually he comes across the bishop, and of course the bishop takes him in because the bishop is the best character in Les Mis. And Jean Valjean is so shocked at how much respect the bishop is showing him, he's not mentioning the fact that he is a convict, he's just treating him like he was any other person that he would meet on the street. Down to the fact that he is even referring to him as Monsieur, he is showing him that kindness. And Valjean does not realise that the bishop is the bishop, he just thinks that because of the appearance of the bishop and the appearance of his home, that he's just like a lowly like parish priest. That maybe he doesn't even have a parish that he belongs in, he's just like a priest who has no flock. He doesn't know that he's the bishop because of the appearance, and it's kind of like, like this dual theme of not judging people for their appearances. Everybody judges Valjean and his appearance, and Valjean judges other people on their appearances. It's, it's like, oh. They all retire for the night, and Valjean goes to bed, and then four hours later, he wakes up because he is too comfortable, because he has spent 19 years, like, lying on a plank on, of wood on the floor. He has never been so comfortable in his entire life, and that wakes him up. And he's thinking, he's thinking, he, he's just so confused by this kindness that the bishop has showed him, and his first action is kind of, lashing out. He ends up taking the bishop's silver and he runs off. We also learn a bit more about his life and about his imprisonment and it's just, it's so brutal. I'm saying this like I've not read it before, but I, I knew it was brutal, but oh my god, reading it again. Oh. He's then captured by the authorities and the authorities take him back to the bishop and the bishop is just kind of like, oh yeah, nice to see you, I'm so glad to see you. You forgot these silver candlesticks, you didn't take them with the rest of the silver that I gave you. And John Valjean is just like, what? So the bishop pretends that he did give all of the silver to Jean Valjean and then also gives him the silver candlesticks. These silver candlesticks that he, we are told that he treasures beyond anything that he owns. The one physical material possession that he would miss if he didn't have it and he gives it to this man. And as you can imagine, Valjean is just shocked by the whole thing. And it just sets off this like big epiphany and thought explosion in his brain. And he's still processing this hours later when he comes across this young boy called Petit Chevet who has this 40 suit coin. This little boy is like throwing his coin up and down and then it drops and it rolls onto the floor and Valjean like automatically stands on the coin and will not give it to this child. And it's kind of explained as like he's still kind of processing what he's thinking. This epiphany he is having is still taking like it, it's still it's still processing, it's still going, he's still downloading this update. But the taut reaction that he has had from the years of neglect 
neglect in his life is that he wants to take this coin away from the little boy. The little boy runs off crying and Valjean hasn't even registered that this has happened. And then when he does finally register a few moments later, he is full of remorse. He's been shown so much kindness from the bishop and being told that he has to make his life better. And then the first thing that he does is an act of unkindness, another crime, another act of thievery. And he just breaks down sobbing. And yeah, oh my God. This book is so emotional. I, I I don't know how much it came through on the live stream, but I, I I am so wrecked by this book. This book is so good. Like I know Les Mis is a massive, massive book and it's a big undertaking, but like if you if you have it, if you get the chance, please read it. It is so good. And yes, I know I'm only a hundred pages in, so you know, I can't speak to the rest of it on my reread, but ah. I know recently the topic of like prison reform and the way that we uh, our justice system is set up is a massive topic that people are talking about and if you've been interested in that conversation like there is so much relevant material in this 19th century book this question of how far the justice system is actually helping these people and rehabilitating them as far as Victor Hugo is concerned as far as Jean Valjean is concerned it is not doing any of that you know it's one thing to talk about violent crimes it's one thing to talk about how we should treat murderers rapists that that kind of thing but like when it's a petty crime, when it's stealing a non-violent crime, why do we need to lock these people away for years and years and years? What mental impact does that have on that person? And how are they able to live their lives after the fact? Obviously over time, things are definitely improving, but like in the case of Jean Valjean, he gets given five years for this one act, this one act of desperation that happens because of his circumstance, because his family are starving. He didn't steal the loaf of bread for himself. He stole it to feed his sister's starving children. That was all down to circumstance. Victor Hugo even mentions that according to an English statistic at this time in the 19th century, century, four out of five crimes of robberies are done because of starvation. So shouldn't that be taken into account? Shouldn't people's circumstances and why they did that crime be taken into account? Hello everybody, it is editing Charlotte from the future here. Something that I was also going to mention when I was talking about Valjean and his imprisonment was that Valjean cannot even escape that one small act, that one moment of stealing a crime even after he's freed. The fact that he has this yellow passport that he has to show to authorities everywhere he goes means that he is always mocked out as a former convict. And the social stigma, especially in the 19th century, was just immense. No one will serve him, no one will trust him. He gets paid half the amount that other people get paid. All because there was one moment where he and his family were starving. All because of one moment. And it's really heartbreaking. If you've ever been interested in this conversation about human nature, are people innately good or is, is bad behavior something that is taught? Is that something that comes out of circumstance? Something that really hit home for me and something I don't think really comes across quite as well in the musical, I think it comes across a lot better in the BBC television show, is the fact that at the end of this chapter, yes, Valjean has determined that he's going to make his life better, that he is going to become an honest man, but his like mental journey his like self-discovery, if you will, is far from over because he is still a man who thinks in extremes. Victor Hugo even says that he knows that he's on the precipice of something. He can either go all in and being a good man. And if he's going to go down the path of being good, then he is going to be the most good. He is going to be an angel or he feels himself being tugged down another direction. And if he's going to be bad, then he's going to be the worst person who's ever been. <laughs> and because of that, because he does eventually choose to become an honest man, he is full of self-loathing for himself. He's kind of seeing himself as Jean Valjean the villain. And he can't reconcile that there is kind of a middle ground to be met. He can't reconcile his past. He sees himself as a terrible person and he is striving to not be that anymore. And it's so interesting to think about. And it's something that I think, like I say, the musical doesn't really delve much into. Once Valjean kind of reforms, that seems to be it for him in the musical. He is constantly a good man after that. There never seems to be this like inner struggle of him like trying to choose good. Whereas I feel like in the television show, like it's all over the place. He can constantly like teeter over to either side at any point. There are moments with the television show with Dominic West's portrayal of Jean Valjean where you could feel like he could go bad at any time. He could choose violence at any moment. And it's his choice to be good, to be kind, that he is constantly making throughout the course of the television show and throughout the course of the book. And I just think it's really interesting. It's just such a good book, guys. I, I Let me know how you're all enjoying it because I'm, I, I, 
I'm a bundle of emotions right now. Hello, hello. So it is currently the 6th of January today. We have spent the day taking down all of the Christmas decorations and I'm so sad about it. And it's been a couple of days since I updated you on my progress with Les Mis. So in the last couple of days, I've read books three and four of part one, Fontaine. And it is in book three that we actually meet the title character of this section, Fontaine, so yay. In part three, we meet Fontaine as a young woman. She's about 20 years old. She lives in Paris. She has three friends and she also has a lover, Felix. And Fontaine is just head over heels in love with Felix. He is her one true love. However, Felix comes from quite a wealthy family and he is constantly being told by his parents that he must come home. It's made very clear that Felix does not see his relationship with Fontaine as being serious and he is clearly not in love with her as much as she is with him. As I say, Fontaine has three other friends and they are all in relationships with friends of Felix's. And then one day, two or three years into the relationships, Felix decides that he is going to send them a surprise. He gets all four couples together for dinner. They have a great song and dance and then all of the men leave. About an hour later, the butler arrives with a letter from the four men. And the surprise is they're getting dumped, basically. That these four young men have been called home from their parents and this is the end of the relationship. And the other three women think of it as a great joke. However, Fontaine goes home and starts crying her eyes out because what we have not realized up until this moment is that Fontaine and Felix had a child together and she is now left to fend for this two-year-old child child on her own. As we get into book four, we discover that Fontaine has sent repeated letters to Felix to acknowledge his child, to send money for Cosette, and he has just not even acknowledged them. So now she is really, really struggling for money. It's in book four where she is traveling to go find somewhere to work. She ends up leaving Cosette being looked after by an innkeeper and his wife. After she sees the two children of the innkeeper playing so happily together, she believes that Cosette will be happy here. Little does she know the innkeeper and his wife, Madame and Monsieur Thenardier, are horrible, horrible people who end up mistreating Cosette horribly, all the while writing letters to Fontaine asking for more and more money that she doesn't have. And yeah, this is why they call it Les Miserables because this is really, really sad. I think I said on the Discord server that, you know, you get to these two chapters and there are a couple of people who I want to give big hugs to in the book and other people who I just want to give a smack to. And I think it's quite clear who is who. <laughs> Something I find really interesting from a more modern perspective is looking at the ways in which Victor Hugo characterises Fontaine. Something I picked up a lot more on this read this time around uh, is the way that Victor Hugo kind of goes out of his way to explain to us that we must be sympathetic to Fontaine because even though she did give herself to Felix like a wife would, aka they had sex, they had a child together, even though they were unmarried, he wants us to keep in mind that her soul is still pure, that she is virginal in spirit, which I understand why in the 19th century when he was writing, wanting to have that claim and wanting people to know that we must feel sorry for her. But is that necessary at all for a modern audience? I argue no. And it was kind of weird and jarring to read. Don't worry guys, she's a virgin at heart. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Just having this reminder of how sensibilities have changed. That Victor Hugo is having to tell us that we must still be sympathetic to her. Whereas as a modern reader, I'm feeling like, of course I feel sorry for Fontaine, like she's being mistreated horribly. She's basically being ditched by the love of her life, left to fend for herself and her child on her own. Of course I'm gonna feel sorry for her. But at least in the 19th century, Victor Hugo feels like he has to really drum up support from the audience for her. I point it out because I think it's interesting and I think it's also very pertinent to say that that's not very long ago. Anyway, on to book five. Apologies guys, I didn't end up closing out this video properly, but that has been the reading vlog where I go through books one to four of part one Fontaine. Do let me know how you are getting on with Lamers so far, any thoughts you have about these chapters. And once again, if you do have any Lamers related questions, whether it's to do with the book or the musical, anything, I would love to hear from you and chat more about them in these reading vlogs. I hope you're all doing well and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.